There is a book that's been circling around TikTok for a while now. I'm sure you've seen it. Playground by Erin Beauregard. It's supposed to be really messed up, really disgusting. So naturally, I got curious and read it. Today, we're going to take a look at what Playground is all about and why people can't make it through the whole thing. Playground is a splatterpunk. It's a subgenre of horror that even most horror fans don't like to consume. So check the trigger warnings, kids. I hope you're not actually kids, though, because that would be really uncomfortable. The Grimleys are not a rich family, but they're doing just fine. That is until Tom Grimley, the father, gets fired from his job. Ever since then, they've been struggling to make the ends meet. But Tom and Molly are good parents, alright? They're trying their best to not make their kids aware of their financial struggles and give them a healthy and stress-free childhood. They have three kids, Isaac, the oldest, Sam, the middle child, and Sadie, the youngest. Even though technically Sam is a year older than Sadie, everyone who sees them thinks they must be twins. It's not only their looks that's almost identical, but also their cheery, loud, and somewhat annoying behavior. However, their personalities is a stark contrast to their brother Isaac, especially Sadie. Isaac is bullied a lot in school already for being a scrawny little guy, so his younger sister knowing the ways to hurt his self-esteem doesn't help his case. But with the ups and downs, the life of the Grimleys is as normal and ordinary as it gets. For now. With an alcoholic dad and an uncaring mom, the Matthews kids are not doing okay. Not even close. Both Greg and Lacey Matthews have failed to make their aspirations come true when they were young, so now they're trying to live their lives vicariously through their children. Lacey, the cheerleader who had everyone's attention in high school, became a nobody who forces her only daughter, Tanya, into doing what she did, in the hopes that Tanya does it better and stays relevant even after high school, totally ignoring Tanya's own wishes to become a competitive swimmer. Greg, a football player, gets injured in the knee during his peak and now sees his own kids as nothing but investments. Except the oldest son, Bobby, who's a good-for-nothing skateboard-riding fatso in his dad's eyes, which makes Bobby desire his father's affection and attention so much more than his siblings. CJ, the one that came after Bobby, is also the one that gave Greg hope for the first time. CJ does whatever his dad asks of him, because he just simply doesn't want to deal with his father's uncontrollable rage. He plays baseball, and only plays baseball. He doesn't have a life of his own. He barely gets a few hours on the weekends where he can do whatever he wishes, as long as what he wishes doesn't put him in immediate danger. We can't have the one child with pure athleticism running through his veins end up as a loser because, what, he tried to have fun? Fun? Absolutely unacceptable. Kip, the youngest, is sort of the backup plan in case CJ messes up somehow, so he's basically doing everything that CJ did when he was Kip's age. The Matthews kids are absolutely miserable because instead of parents, they have two narcissistic assholes who see dollar signs whenever they look at them. Except for Bobby. No one gives a damn about Bobby, and neither should you. Compared to the other two families, the Clarks are very compact in size. We have the mom, Caroline, with a smoking addiction who uses her son, six-year-old Donnie, as an ashtray and walks him on a leash so that he doesn't hurt himself. Although we obviously see that the only reason Donnie ever gets hurt is because of the one holding the leash. One day, all the families, the Grimleys, the Matthews, and the Clarks are handed a brochure by a big fella that promises them fun and a substantial amount of money. Geraldine Borden aims to implement one state-of-the-art playground in 1995, somewhere in the New England area. After a review of potential candidates, a less fortunate region will be selected, and the grand play space will be presented as a surprise to the chosen representative's city and the lucky children who reside within it. The paper basically says, Come and let your kids play in our new modern playground for four hours, and tell us what you think of it. After that, you'll be given $4,000 each. The kids get to have fun, and the parents get to have money. What could possibly go wrong? 
Geraldine Borden is a disturbed woman. To simply put it, she has an obsession with her image, not in the way you might think. She doesn't have body image issues or anything like that where she examines herself in the mirror for hours every day and cries. No, Ger Geraldine Borden has a room that's filled with mirrors, with dildos suctioned on each mirror, and she goes into that room to fuck herself for hours every day while staring at her reflection. Geraldine Borden has been obsessed with herself probably since she first gained consciousness. Geraldine Borden is the kind of a woman who would make Freud proud. Geraldine Borden ate her mother's poop when she was a teenager and then got herself off in the same breath with the same hands. Geraldine Borden, when she was in her 40s, killed her own sick mother by taking the mask that was supplying her oxygen off and attacking her face with a box full of chocolates just so that she could have the tiniest idea of what it would feel like to actually have sex with herself because Geraldine Borden's mom looks a lot like Geraldine Borden because, you know, she's her mom. Then Geraldine Borden realized that she no longer has someone she could force her perverse fantasies upon, decided to have a baby, but couldn't because thankfully her pussy is a crypt full of dead bodies and dust. Unfortunately though, she managed to adopt a teen boy and then assaulted and abused him in every imaginable way possible. Geraldine Borden won't stop, unless either she finds someone that resembles her and uses them in any way she pleases, or she takes revenge on unexpecting families for simply being able to have kids. Geraldine Borden is the villain of the story, if you didn't get that, but I'm sure you did. Adolfo Fox is a Nazi scientist who has dozens of war crimes to his name, yet when he and his fellow Nazis got caught, instead of, I don't know, imprisoning them? or killing them, the United States just kind of let them go free in the country because their minds are all very precious. One day at a party, Fox and Geraldine met, and Fox did experiments on Geraldine's T-zone to see if she could possibly have a baby, but no amount of water can turn crinkling autumn leaves into happy green trees, but that of course did not stop them from mingling with other things. So they spent years together coming up with very fun ideas for a children's playground. Rock Stanley is Geraldine's adopted son. Sorry, I meant slave. I meant adopted slave. Even though he's basically a 30-year-old mountain of a man, after all kinds of abuse, manipulation, and torture he's been through at the hands of Geraldine for more than half of his life, he seems to be just an obedient servant for the two evil buddies. He's the one who found the kids to test out the playground, but even then, to Geraldine and to Rock himself, he's a failure and a lesser human being, but usually Rock isn't even lucky enough to be treated as a human at all. Just like any other narcissistic piece of shit, Geraldine Borden is extremely territorial. She burned the word mine on Rock's chest to simply let him know who he belongs to after an incident with the help. Geraldine's delusions got her to think that there was something sexual going on between her son and the help. This led Geraldine to kill the help and order Rock to turn her body into fertilizer. Rock is traumatized beyond our understanding. At 11 o'clock sharp, the Matthews and the Grimleys arrive at the Borden Castle and are welcomed by the only three residents, Geraldine, Fox, and Rock. Geraldine explains to them that Helping Hearts is the charity that she works for, and this playground is their latest project that's gonna go to an underdeveloped city. She makes sure that they haven't told anyone about coming here, so that the surprise isn't ruined for the general public, otherwise it would be really, really sad. She lies through her teeth, obviously, and Tom is the only one who is even a little bit suspicious about this whole thing. But he accepts to go through with it at the end because everybody else is up for it and he's not gonna be the fun killer. 
The families are then escorted into the backyard of the castle where the playground stands. Belt swing, flat swing, bucket swing, straight slide, curved slide, spiral slide, seesaw, monkey bars, merry-go-round, spring riders, mega trampoline, rope climber, dorm climber, sandbox, hopscotch, teeter-totter, steel rings. This playground basically has everything. But the one thing that grabs everyone's attention is the green slide that reaches nosebleed heights with no way to climb it and no way to get ejected out of it since the slide goes underground. When questioned about it, Geraldine makes up a lie saying that that's for decor, it's okay my little ones, go play. Later on when all the kids are inside the playground, she takes the parents to the spy room on the third floor. The room is filled with monitors where you can watch the playground at any angle. The parents line up and sit down. Geraldine pulls another lie out of her ass and tells the parents to do some yoga exercises with her to calm their nerves. When they're doing their little knack relaxing routine, she presses a button and the parents get chained into their seats by their necks. Except for Lacey Matthews, who moves last second to grab her bracelet off the floor and the neck chain impales her, well, in the neck, and she dies of death. Screaming and crying, Greg, Tom, and Molly are left to watch their kids have much worse fates than Lacey for hours, with only one chance to talk to their kids through a speaker for a few simple seconds. But before the real game begins for the kids, the door of the castle rings, and Rock finds Caroline and little Donnie standing before him. The first time he ever saw Caroline was when she was in a playground with Donnie in the pouring rain. Seeing the leash around little Donnie reminded Rock of some things in his past and his present, and hated Caroline with every fiber in his being from then on. Now that he sees the leash is still around the little boy, and he falls and scrapes his knee because of it right in front of Rock, he can't control himself. And he doesn't want to. He wants to bash Caroline's skull in. And he does. Because the leash that's attached to his back isn't merely a measure of safety. It's a symbol. A lack of trust. A sense of ownership. A craving for control. A symbol of dominance. And because Caroline Clark knew exactly what she was doing, just like Geraldine Borden knows exactly what she's doing. After murdering his mom right in front of him, Rock then patches up strangely calm Donnie in the bathroom, just to let him into the playground to meet his doom. He thinks that ending up dead is much better for little Donnie than ending up in foster care like him, because then he won't ever have to cross paths with someone like Geraldine. While some of the kids are playing in the playground and Isaac is getting bullied by Bobby and Kip because Greg got on the wrong foot with Tom, Rock suddenly enters with two Doberman dogs in his hands and releases them into the area. Simultaneously, an entryway opens into the monstrous green slide. With two Doberman chasing them and pretty much know where the kids can hide, they panic and start running around like headless chickens. Their only way out seems like to go into the metal box. They don't all make it inside without casualties of course since CJ is being chased by one and Isaac is being viciously bit by another. CJ is an athletic genius though so he climbs one of the smaller slides, rips his shirt off, ties it around the dog's head and just yeets it off the slide, then rushes to save Isaac and does so by throwing sand into the dog's eyes. They both get into the metal box with Isaac heavily bleeding, but this is only the beginning. After everyone is inside, the metal box starts elevating and when it comes to a halt, there's only the entrance to the slide and a sign in the room that reads, Playground Rules. Before the kids can figure out what any of this means, the wall behind them starts closing, which forces them to go down the slide in a hurry. The slide, aside from looking like it leads down into the void, also has razor blades embedded in the plastic, which doesn't leave any of the kids untouched. When they make it out the other end of the slide, they're all pretty badly cut up. 
The landing isn't soft either. CJ hears what sounds like countless balls rolling on the ground and turns to take in the sight. The room looks about the size of a gymnasium. The countless aching points that crash into his body upon landing becomes obvious. The entire floor is covered with marbles. And as if that isn't enough, dozens of baseballs start being launched at them at a dangerous speed. The room has several stone pillars ahead and a sizable ball pit. A pink neon sign reading exit hangs at the other end of the space. Not being able to get up because of the balls, the torn up kids start crawling their way into the ball pit, leaving a slimy blood trail behind them. The closer they get to the ball pit, the clearer they start hearing the noises of a man gagging and choking. Upon further inspection, they notice that the sounds are coming from a dummy that's hanging above the ball pit. Behind the creepy hanging man, there's a school chalkboard with several words written on it. The children are all freaking out, but one in particular, Sam Grimley, is reacting to the situation they're in so much worse than others. Being slashed while going down the slide, the noises coming from the dummy, the puzzle that they have to solve is just too much for her. So she runs into the direction of the exit sign and enters the dark corridor. Sadie, being the good little sister, follows behind her to try to persuade Sam to come back, but before she is able, there's an explosion. The blast sends Sadie tumbling on the floor. When she looks at where she last saw Sam, she realizes what just happened. One of Sam's legs is no longer attached to her body. Hearing the cries coming from the two girls, everyone rushes to the corridor. But while the kids are trying to make sense of what just happened, the ceiling begins to close on them. CJ and Isaac run in to help Sam and both kids start dragging her out of there before they all get squished. They're doing their best to get Sam out, but the ceiling's pace suddenly quickens and Isaac takes a wrong step and falls onto the floor. CJ grabs Isaac from the shirt and throws him out, but that means he's too late to grab Sam. She gets crushed under the ceiling. Sadie holds her sister's hand and starts yanking, but she can't get her out. Instead, she falls backwards with Sam's severed arm in her hands. CJ looks at the unglued group. All the kids are shocked and disoriented, except for Donnie, who seems to have no sign of emotion on his face. Kids try to part their eyes from Sam's pulverized body and turn their attention to the puzzle on the chalkboard. Tanya is the one who figures out that the puzzle says, stab him in the head. But in order to reach the hangman, someone has to parkour their way over to the ball pit. That someone is of course CJ. At first, everything is going well for him. He's good at maintaining his balance on the tiny steps going across the hangman's platform. But then his focus shifts into the worst scenarios that can happen to him if he falls. And then of course, CJ falls. The bottom of the ball pit is filled with salt crystals and they start burning CJ's back that's been cut up on the slide, but he's still alive. He finds a ladder that goes up to the platform, retrieves the dummy and the knife in his hand, throws the dummy and the knife down where the kids are waiting for him. Sadie then grabs the knife and stabs the dummy in the head which allows all the hungry fire ants inside it to come rushing out and start munching on the kids. CJ spots a plastic bag inside the head and takes both dad and dummy's clothes to patch up Bobby's wounds since Bobby is the only one whose skin and meat are basically flapping around, and then he kicks the head into the ball pit. Inside the plastic bag, there's a skeleton key and a note that says, Playground Rules. You must follow directions or all shall bleed. Remember the playground chooses when you actually leave. If your reaction was swift like the crack of a whip, then you'd notice the lever to the left of the pit. Pull down and in the ceiling you'll see the hole inside the pink is awaiting a key. They find the hot pink sign and insert the skeleton key into the lock, which opens up a way into a new room and a new game. As the children depart the metal duct, they land on a rock platform. 
The heavy stone material is about the size of a tight bedroom, but unlike any of their bedrooms, the edges of the platform drop off into a pit of darkness. The uncertain borders are frightful, but they are soon drawn ahead to the next path of peril. A straight stretch of hopscotch lays ahead. The chalk outline displays a single column that consists of eight steps. The setup is traditional, one that all the children have seen at one time or another, but the final space is labeled heaven. Besides the word, there are also disturbing artwork that cover the entire space. The chalky sketches are gruesome in nature. They portray several angels being ripped apart. One has been stabbed and is covered in gaping wounds, while another hangs lifelessly from a noose. There's even a third angel that's being strangled with its own halo by a pair of devilish hands. Beyond the blasphemous artwork stands a cracked open door. Nothing can be seen except the ominous crimson glow that bleeds out from the other side. Above the framework, painted in a drippy red font, the word hell is displayed. On each side of the hopscotch, there are two enormous rectangular meat grinders. Right above them, four full-grown alive cows are standing on a platform divided equally between the meat grinders. At the end of the hopscotch outline, in front of each meat grinder, there are also two clear tubes that go up. While everyone is taking a breather and CJ is finally patching up his big brother, his younger sister Tanya spots a sign that says, Playground rules. Forget throwing stones, just make it across, but losing this game is the ultimate loss. For what lies ahead is a horrible drop, when you've gotta move past to see mom and pop. But first things first, go for a hop, but take a wrong step and become the slop. You have no choice, you must play the game, and learn that heaven and hell are one and the same. Up until this moment, Donnie hasn't spoken a single word. The kids don't even know if he understands them. But when they're talking about whether or not Donnie knows how to play hopscotch, he starts running right into the chalk outline and plays the game perfectly and lands right on top of heaven. But unfortunately, he then turns around and starts making his way back to the beginning of the game like how you would in a traditional hopscotch. But this is no traditional hopscotch. CJ, not knowing what exactly might happen if Donnie makes it all the way back, rushes to play the game himself and grabs little Donnie halfway into it and they both successfully make it across in one piece. Without leaving much time for celebration, the ceiling once again starts closing on the kids. Sadie and Tanya make it across and next is Isaac. But right when he's in the middle of the game, the hatch holding the cows opens up and the cows fall right into the meat grinder. The tubes fill up with blood, flesh and guts and come gushing out right on the hopscotch. Before Isaac gets hit with it, he launches forward and throws himself into heaven. But the slimy meat porridge doesn't miss Kip. Little Kip can't balance himself and falls head first into the meat grinder. The last one left to reach heaven is Bobby but seeing his baby brother's body being crushed freezes him in place. When he collects himself, the tubes are no longer filled with calf's bladder, but Kip's bladder. Bobby makes it to the other side, covered in his brother's remnants. As soon as Bobby makes it across, he punches Isaac because he blames him for Kip's death. CJ breaks them up and all the kids move on to the next room through the hellish corridor. The path leads to a fork. They're now presented with a choice. One side of the room offers a swing set placed within a rectangle of soft sand. The swings are not your regular kinds, they stand very tall. On the opposite of the swing set, there's another platform, but in order to get there, you have to swing and jump across the gigantic gap between the two platforms and hope that you land. On the other side, there are eight different spring riders, again not your regular kinds. Instead of the cute horse or a colorful car, they very much look like they've been designed by the Adams family. A human heart, a devil, a brain, a Venus flytrap, a rat, a cockroach, a vampire, and a maggot. Tanya takes a look around and spots a sign that says, Playground Rules. 
Two on the swings, the rest on the springs, then you'll just have to figure some things. Kids are hella confused because the sign doesn't really say a lot, but they decide that Sadie and Isaac will take the swings because Bobby is a threat and the rest are gonna go on the springs. Very fittingly, CJ picks the heart, Bobby picks the devil, Tanya the brain, and Donnie the Venus flytrap. They start going back and forth on the spring riders which makes them move on the platform. Suddenly in the darkness behind the red floodlights on the wall, a loud unhinging noise rings out. Slicing through the darkness, two pendulum axes, each roughly about the size of a motorcycle, appear. CJ yells everyone to stop and everyone does stop, except for Donnie. The boy keeps going. CJ and Bobby jump out just before the axes come for the devil and the heart slashing them both. They get on the other spring riders that are unharmed and keep going. Meanwhile, Sadie and Isaac sit on the swings trying to find the courage to do this. But suddenly the platform filled with sand underneath them vanishes and is replaced by flames. As soon as they feel the heat, they start swinging. Isaac makes it across and with his encouragement, so does Sadie. Just as Sadie lands on the platform, the others finish their part and all the kids are back together again. The next room has a set of colorful monkey bars that goes all the way over to a separate area. On the other side of the monkey bars, there are two slides that extend to nosebleed elevation. The space below the monkey bars consists of glass shards and hundreds of snakes. Snakes already cut themselves on the glass shards so they're also covered in blood. Once again, Tanya finds a sign that says, Playground Rules. Like a monkey swing all the way, but slip and the fangs will find you today. Should any feet reach the other side, then pick just the right moment to go down the slide. The monkey bars are so high that some of the smaller kids can't possibly reach them without help. So CJ offers that he and Bobby will help the kids and then go across the last. But Bobby refuses, because hell with everyone else. If he's the only one to survive, so be it, why should he care about anyone else? Just as Bobby is walking to the bars, a loud noise starts coming from the speakers in the room. It's Molly Grimley, and she warns the kids about the monkey bars. They've been greased, and if they try to hold on, they'll just fall. So they should climb on top of the bars instead, and then the voice cuts off. With this new information, kids actually have a chance, except for Bobby. Bobby is scared that because of his weight, he's not going to be able to climb on top of the monkey bars without falling. You can't just, you can't just fall into the pit of glass and wipers, Bobby. Not everyone deserves to survive in here, Bobby. Fuck you, Bobby. Fuck you, you piece of shit. I mean, that would be the dream scenario, but of course CJ doesn't leave his big brother behind. After every kid goes across, he climbs the bars and pulls Bobby up, which is just a huge bummer. But hold on. Hold on a minute. Would, how did Molly Grimley know that the monkey bars were greasy? After Fox and Geraldine leave the screaming parents in the spy room, they go into a private room where they can watch both the kids and the parents. What they do mostly in there is drink champagne and laugh like the evil maniacs that they are. But a few things happen in there that's worth mentioning. Geraldine gets obsessed with Tanya because of her calm and collected attitude towards the whole thing and the intelligence she's shown so far. She starts wishing that if anyone survives until the end, it's Tanya, so that she can turn her into her slave and even starts pleasuring herself at the thought of it while watching Tanya on the screen. If we move to the spy room though, it's mostly Tom and Molly crying, screaming, throwing up, and Greg just being a competitive son of a bitch. Dude doesn't even care that kids are being tortured, he doesn't care his kids are being tortured, he doesn't care that they're trapped, he doesn't care his wife died right next to him and he couldn't do shit about it. The only thing he cares is that the one who ends up surviving this whole thing is gonna be a Matthews. When Kip died, all he said was, ah, oh, that's very sad. At least he wasn't CJ though. Like, your son got turned into mush, bro. 
What do you mean? Raul is being a piece of fucking garbage. Molly and Tom try to get Rock to betray Geraldine and Fox because they think he's not one of them. At least not entirely. Listen, Rock doesn't want anything bad to happen to any of the kids, but especially Donnie. He's still holding on to his leash and he's stressed out about it. There's no live audio going from the spy room into the private room, so Rock cracks and tells them that the monkey bars are greasy. And because Rock is deeply afraid of Geraldine, she doesn't even suspect that this is his doing. I mean, Molly's gonna regret warning the kids in a minute. Because if she didn't, then Bobby would be dead. And wouldn't that be just so nice? Each of the slides are positioned at the beginning of a pit of blackness. The long slab of U-shaped metal stretches on for 30 yards over the certain doom. The ride ends on a lower level platform where an open elevator door awaits. But coasting over the gaping void isn't even close to the most terrifying aspect of the sadistic stunt. Beneath each of the slides are clusters of circular saw blades. They're positioned in a way that upon the scent, there's no way to avoid crossing over them. But in a perverse gimmicky fashion, the machinery attached beneath the slides pushes the spinning blades through the slits and then backs them out, rotating every few seconds. This means if they slide down in just the right time, they can actually make it unharmed. But that's not enough torture, so the glass and wiper filled platform starts rising behind them. So if they don't figure out when to slide and do it quickly, they're gonna have to deal with hundreds of venomous snakes. CJ is an athletic genius, but Isaac is mathematical engineering Spencer Reed from the FBI. I have so many bachelors, PhDs, and doctors that you couldn't even possibly list in one breath genius. So he counts the seconds of the saw blades going up and down the slide, and to make sure he's correct, he slides his shoe down on the moment he thinks is right, and to everyone's surprise, the shoe makes it out in one piece. After the shoe, he slides down himself, and after surviving, he tells the others one by one when to come down. Tanya, Donnie, and CJ make it out alive, and the last ones are Bobby and Sadie. Sadie is scared to go down, because flashes of her sister's death doesn't leave her mind alone. She thinks that she's gonna end up like Sam. She even accidentally pisses herself sitting on the top of the slide, which rings as alarm bells, because if she doesn't slide down soon, the snakes are gonna come for them. Then the speaker goes on again. This time, it's Greg Matthews. Bobby, I know I've always been down on you for not having what it takes to play ball. But maybe I was wrong. Maybe that skateboarding you do can actually help you. Just think about it, son. If you find something to ride down on, then you won't get hurt. These little fuckers killed Kip. We can't just let them get away with it. It's only fair. Don't disappoint me, son. Don't disappoint me. And then his voice cuts off. Greg tells his son, his 13-year-old son Bobby, to use 8-year-old Sadie as a skateboard, so that Sadie is the one that gets caught in health, not him. Bobby has been craving attention and acceptance from his dad his entire life, and now he's presented a chance to get it. Not only does his dad want him to survive, but also he wants him to revenge his little brother's death. What an opportunity to make his father proud. So he does what Greg told him to do. Bobby face plants Sadie, stabs her in the back, steps on her like he's riding on a skateboard, and starts going down the slide. In the process, little Sadie's body becomes unrecognizable. After Bobby kills Sadie in such a violent fashion, Isaac lunches at him. But before he can even put a finger on him, Bobby pulls out a knife. It's the knife that the hangman was holding. After they were done with that puzzle, CJ held onto the knife, but around the Spring Riders chapter, he dropped it, and Bobby was the one who picked it up. CJ tries to reason with Bobby because he's horrified of what his brother has just done and might do next, but Bobby just thinks CJ is scared that he no longer has their dad's attention, 
and is jealous of it. No one can get to Bobby's head right now but Greg. And Bobby is the oldest and the largest of the group, and they just witnessed what he can do, and now he also has a knife. They just don't stand a chance against him, they can't fight him, so they reluctantly obey him and get in the elevator. The elevator leads to a room with a merry-go-round in the middle of it. As soon as they enter the room, chemical fumes start filling up their nostrils. The fumes are coming off of the man-made moat that surrounds the merry-go-round. It's filled with a neon green substance. The roundabout itself is rusty, the iron bars are corroded, the wood frame is rickety and splintered, the foundation squeaks with each revolution. It's not a ride designed to derive pleasure, it's a ride of doom. Past the roundabout, there's another platform, but there's no way that leads there from the roundabout itself. There's a doorway on the platform that reads the end, question mark. Tanya finds a sign that says, playground, rules. To reach the end, you all must play, to see your parents once more today. Hold on tight for the final hooray, or just let go and melt away. Tanya and Isaac both get on the merry-go-round and hug an iron bar each. CJ takes Donnie in between him and the iron bar so the little kid can not fly off. And as soon as Bobby gets on and finds his spot, the platform he was just standing on crumbles and the merry-go-round starts spinning at a dangerous rate. The kids are already vomiting because of the spinning but also the chemical fumes that they're inhaling. At one point, Isaac's iron bar gets loose from its hinges, and he starts flapping around. CJ can't help him because he has to hold Donnie, and Tanya is in at a distance that can help, so the only one left is Bobby, and Bobby would rather eat shit than to help Isaac, and Isaac knows this. He still asks for help from Bobby in the moment, but he holds up his knife, and the loudspeaker comes on once again. This time, it's Tom Grimley. He tells Bobby to get the fuck away from his son or he'll kill him, but before that, he'll kill his dad. But he gets caught off by piece of shit Greg and he tells Bobby to kill Isaac because his dad is bluffing. And Isaac thinks, instead of falling into the toxic slime on his own, he grabs onto Bobby, brings him down with him. Isaac does this not only because Bobby killed his little sister Sadie, but also the only kid who is not a Matthews, is Donnie. He knows that Bobby has no problem killing kids weaker than him, so he knows Donnie is Bobby's next target if he's gone, and he can't let anything happen to him. So they both fall into the toxic slime, and they melt fairly shortly. When the roundabout came to a standstill, CJ and Tanya felt a hammering of devastation. They remembered a different version of their big brother, one that existed before the evil and unflinching threats had tarnished them. At times, Bobby had been a prick and a bit of a bully, but nothing the likes of what they'd witnessed in the playground. They each mourned the mostly positive sentiments they knew him to harbor, there was one other feeling that neither CJ nor Tanya would ever dare admit, not to themselves and not to each other. It gnawed at their hearts, but they ignored it. They each felt a certain measure of relief in knowing that Bobby was gone. His unpredictability and anger issues had made each of them periodically wonder if he would think twice about sacrificing his own family if he could ensure his own survival by doing so. A single day had changed so much. The dark alterations were glaring. It was as if the playground amplified the absolute best or worst traits of the children imprisoned within it. After Isaac and Bobby die, the merry-go-round comes to a halt. A platform rises connecting the roundabout to the doorway labeled the end? As they enter the room, they notice it's much tighter than all the other rooms. Almost the entire room is occupied by a giant seesaw that extends nearly 10 feet high. The seats attached to the structure have cushy back support for the seats, which is not traditional. Below each seat, there's a large red coil spring. Should the bottom of the seesaw connect, the spring would increase the momentum. In the middle of the seesaw, there's a metal pole that goes several feet into the air. 
Screwed at the top of the pole, there are two giant propellers that extend the entire width of the seesaw. On the wall, there's a scoreboard with two zeros displayed. Under the scoreboard, Tanya sees a sign that says, Playground Rules. Up and down till the count strikes 10, but not too high to keep your friend. Should you avoid an untimely end, then your parents may see your faces again. CJ and Tanya both decide that Donnie should sit this one out, and then take their places on the seats, wanting this nightmare to be over already. When they sit, two hooks eject from the seats and impale their shoulders, trapping them into the seats. With nothing else to do but play the game, Tanya starts pushing CJ up towards the propellers. There's a certain height that they need to go up to for the scoreboard to update. They each take a turn. When the scoreboard hits 5, without warning, flames erupt from underneath the steel gridding they're stepping on. The flames reaching their ankles, they still try to power through it. 6, 7, 8, 9. Tanya is pushing up CJ, but the flames are melting her skin off around her ankles, and she can no longer take it, so she bounces up. She looks over to CJ as she does it and realizes that her brother is not conscious. This means CJ can secure himself and control the pivot. This means CJ's side of the seesaw flies up with the momentum right into the propellers. Tanya stops it by pushing herself up just to the right height to get the last point on the scoreboard. And she does, but the propellers cut off the top of her seat and her end of the seesaw rockets back to the ground, and this makes CJ hit the peak. The propellers cut CJ's head off. The harsh circular heck left the brain split into two pieces, and CJ's cranial juices erupted in every direction. He'd become the embodiment of his favorite fruit snack, Gushers. This is a line from the book. Donnie grabs Tanya's arms and carries her out of the flames. Even though he's burning as well, the kid has no reaction on his face. They walk into the tunnel together. The room it leads to has a giant sandbox with a bunch of leather blocks sprinkled all over it. Next to the sandbox, there's a rope climber that ascends 50 yards into dark space. The altitude of the climb isn't the whole problem. Not only can you not see where it leads to, but also there's a metal rod in the middle of the red ropes and spears are ejecting and retracting from it, ready to impale anything and everything in their way. It's a sadistic torture device like any other we've seen this far. Tanya finds a set of letter blocks that spells out Playground Rules. No time for the scent, just climb to the bell. Only after the chime will you get a final farewell. Tanya looks defeated. She says she doesn't think she can do it. Donnie looks at Tanya, points at the top of the tower of ropes, and then points at himself, signaling that he can. Tanya asks him if he's sure, and Donnie grabs some letter blocks and spells, I can ring it. Tanya asks why he doesn't just talk. He spells, Mama thinks I talk too much. She says that doesn't mean you shouldn't talk at all, and he spells, I can't. Donnie recognizes Tanya's confusion, so he opens his mouth and shows her. Donnie has no tongue. It looks like it's been cut off. Tanya's eyes pop. It all makes sense to her why the little boy was so daring the entire time. He probably doesn't want to go back home anyway. Donnie spells two last things. First, you help me, I help you. And then, I be back. As the tiny terminator is walking towards the ropes, the loudspeaker comes on again. This time, it's Rock Stanley. He says, don't climb it, just stay where you are. The game's over. I'm gonna let you out. Rock Stanley sees too much of himself in little Donnie. All this time, he's been doing Geraldine's dirty work for her. Before the playground was even built fully, they would do test runs with the kids Rock kidnapped. After Geraldine and Adolfo would have their sadistic fun, Rock would be the one dealing with the leftovers. He has been the victim of countless assaults and abuse of all kinds at the hands of a monster, 
and the other one was just as guilty for choosing to be a bystander. What Rock did to Caroline is what Rock wanted to do to Geraldine. After his announcement, in a matter of seconds, Geraldine and Fox make their way into the spy room. Geraldine threatens Rock with her words and Fox with his pistol. He shoots Rock, but that doesn't stop the massive dude. He gets a hold of Fox and bashes his head into the buttons, releasing the parents. Geraldine takes the gun and unloads it on Rock, but he's Rock. He can withstand it. Rock doesn't care. Rock has been through worse than some bullets. While he's busy turning Fox head into pulp, Greg lunges at Tom, taking revenge in his tiny red mind for losing the game. Tom and Molly try to fight him off unsuccessfully, but thankfully Rock finishes Fox just in time to push his sausage fingers into Greg's mouth. He pushes them in as deep as he can and tours up his jaw and his nose bone. The most competitive son of a bitch whose hobby is to run his mouth dies from choking on blood and a dude's fist. Molly patches up Rock's wounds so that he doesn't die on the way to kill Geraldine. They wish him good luck and Rock makes his way towards Geraldine's bedroom. There's usually a vintage rifle mounted on a wall that he seems to can't find, which means Geraldine has it. The section of the castle that Geraldine likes the most, even more than the playground, is the mirror's room. She's pushed up against one of the mirrors with the rifle in her hands waiting to shoot Rock. To his advantage, Rock is the one who built that room, obeying Geraldine's wishes. Rock remembers positioning each mirror. He knows every blind spot in the room. He knows how to trick Geraldine's sight. The second she sees Rock in front of her, she starts shooting, but to her dismay, Rock's figure just comes crashing down in glass shards instead of blood and guts. Even though she's trapped in there, Geraldine doesn't let go of her disgusting nature and still makes dirty remarks about Rock. Remember that word on your chest? You're mine! And no matter what happens, until the day you die, you will always be mine, Geraldine yells. Unless you die first, Rock yells back. He jumps up from behind and knocks her against the mirror. Her rifle flies off and she now is but an old hag with only two options ahead of her. One, accept death. Two, beg and then accept death. Because she doesn't have an understanding of pride or shame, she starts begging in the most idiotic way possible after everything she has done. I'm sorry. I was upset. Please forgive me. I didn't mean it. Rock grabs her head by the sides and lifts her off. Geraldine says, But but I'm your mother. And Rock says, And I'm a motherfucker. <laughs> oh my god, someone help me. Rock starts throwing Geraldine onto every mirror, then he decides to give her what she does the most in that room. He smashes her open mouth right into a dildo, literally fucking her brains out, her dentures flying up and everything. And then he decides that's nearly enough, so he holds her up, takes off her underwear, and slams her down into a glass spear. Geraldine's limp body falls on her side. While death was in the ideal conclusion Geraldine sought that day, her life ended in a way that even she herself might have seen fit. Despite the rosy muddle she's devolved into blurring out almost her entire field of vision from the mirror across the hall, Geraldine was still able to get one final gander at herself. Rock barely walks out of there in one piece and finds Molly and Tom. He says he wants to see the kid, and they help him get to the elevator. They enter the playground and find both Tanya and Donnie waiting to be rescued. Donnie is glad he doesn't have to see his mother again. He doesn't have a full understanding of death yet, so he wasn't exactly sure this entire time if the harm done to his mom by the big man was enough to make her go away forever. With Tanya, it's a bit different. 
She loathes her dad and everything that he has done her entire life, but especially today. She understands that her father did beyond evil things, but she still loves her mom and is devastated to not see her there. All five of them exit the playground and end up at the backyard of the Borden State, the seemingly unharmful playground standing next to them. They have come full circle. They would all now and forever be missing pieces, pieces of their hearts and pieces of their families. No matter how dysfunctional or difficult they could be, they were still family. But in a way, when the mishmash of misfit bloodlines stood beside each other, it almost felt like their collective horrors and heartaches had fused them together. And as the waning sunlight shone upon them, the broken stood as one. Just because the scattered fragments had been drawn together in Frankenstein fashion, they didn't change the result. If anything, the extreme suffering and severe trauma made them closer to a traditional family. The bond they all shared was odd and unintentional, yet still undeniable. Rock says his goodbyes to everyone because he's not gonna make it, and to be honest, he doesn't want to. He knows Tom and Molly care about both Tanya and Donnie, and they don't have to share blood to be a family. Every time Rock looked at Tom and Molly in the spy room, he saw how much love and worry they had in their eyes, for not only their kids, but for all of the kids, even for Rock himself. He knows they'd be far better parents for little Donnie than him. He sets them free into their healing process, if they even can after all this, and turns his back and enters the small playground. He tries to go down the slides, but can't because of his big ass. He tries to swing, but he breaks the chains. Finally, he hops on the merry-go-round, and every time he spins, it gets covered in more red. He lays on the platform and stares at the sky. For the first time, in a really long time, a grin takes over Rock's face. Wow, what a what a roller coaster, man! That was what a roll. Sorry, that was me attempting a joke there. Listen, I'm not gonna go into the ethics of writing a book like this where kids die in extreme ways, alright? Or reading it, because then we would be here like for hours and I wanna leave. But to give my thoughts about this book, I don't think like or enjoy are the words I'm looking for, but it was a fast read, I gotta admit that, because the writing style felt like, you know those Reddit scary stories? <laughs> it was a bit like that. It definitely needed an editor or two. The whole concept of making a fucked up playground I thought was an interesting idea, but the, but the fucking design of this goddamn playground was all over the place. Like, they were just way too many slides. I know that it's a castle, but where are we going exactly? What are we to end the pit of blackness? There's always a pit that you can't see. Why? And the ceilings are always closing in. Can, can we just, can we just not? Can we figure out another way to make the kids, you know, go through these traps? I'm pretty sure we can. So why didn't we? Let's talk about the villains. I thought they were really badly written. I don't like when villains are not layered, when the whole story basically revolves around them doing evil shit. One of them is a Nazi scientist. For fuck's sake, which is just the laziest way to tell your reader, Hey, by the way, this guy's fucking evil. And yeah, the author sort of gives reasons for Geraldine's behavior, but never delves deep into her obsession. It's just her doing disgusting things to people she holds prisoner around her. Everyone's talking about page 40, page 40. It's, an, it's a sexual assault scene that I didn't feel like describing between Rock and Geraldine. I was disgusted in that scene because it was just way too long for no reason, but I was also confused because it seems like the author doesn't know about female orgasm. There are also whole paragraphs reserved to describe Geraldine's awful fucking shit smelling pussy. Like the way the author writes about female bodies very questionable. By all means, write fucked up female characters, write them. I'm not defending Geraldine in any way possible, please. Don't even, don't even, don't even let that thought cross your minds, all right? But setting the tone of her evil around the female body itself is just weird to me. 
Like a woman can't get pregnant after many tries and now she's making it everyone else's problem. Really? At one point, the author says this about Geraldine's scars on her vagina left by experiments. The molecules of men left her altered. I've definitely heard an Andrew Tate worshipper say that before. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. And what kind of experiments could they be doing? Like if you're doing something similar to IVF, you inject it in the stomach area. And if it's like collecting sperm and injecting it with a syringe inside the vagina, then how is that leaving scars on the labia? What did you fucking electroshock your pussy like work, goddammit, work, make a baby. So have you seen one up close before? I just hate how men write about women's bodies in the most grotesque way possible when there's no need for it because meanwhile the only thing he tells us about the other villain you know the one who actually built all the torture devices is that he's a nazi german who speaks like this all the time i feel like the smelling of something a little a little misogyny the child characters weren't given much depth either like i did connect with them but on a surface level because they're kids like, I felt bad, except for Bobby. I was joyous when Bobby melted away. Sam and Sadie, we don't even get to learn anything about them, and they die in the most brutal ways. All we know about Tanya is that she likes swimming. Isaac is a boy who gets bullied because he's smart and scrawny. CJ is a people pleaser. Kip is easily impressionable. Bobby's a good for nothing fast, craving attention all the time. Donnie is the abuse kid. If you can describe the characters in one simple sentence, I don't think you read a good book. There was absolutely no character development whatsoever when the author said the playground brings both the good and the bad out of the kids, I lulled hard because Bobby was already a bully and a copy of, her, of his father and all the other kids were fairly kind to one another before the playground anyway. No one changed, not for the better and not for the worse, I don't know what he was talking about. The parents. Lisa was whatever, she died too soon to make a judgement, Greg was a dickhead, and the author used homophobic slurs to amplify his dickheadness, which is again, lazy writing. Did you watch an Eli Roth movie before you started typing, buddy? Huh? What happened there? Just tell me. Tommy and Molly were in disarray for the most part, and I just I couldn't bring myself to care about them, not even a little bit. I don't know why, they were the only good ones. There was potential, okay, the concept was good, the idea was good, it was fucked up, but the potential was wasted. I found the book on TikTok, and I know most people there are way more squeamish than me, so I knew it wasn't gonna be that disturbing. I've never read a book TikTok people recommended that I ended up liking anyway, so I wasn't expecting much. Is it the most disturbing book I've ever read? Yes, but that is only because I haven't read much horror yet, even though it's my favorite genre. Don't judge me, right? It's, it's, it, it's hard out here in the trenches. I can compare to splatterpunk movies I watched though, and I can safely say that I've seen better. Here's the thing, Playground could have been a great commentary on the filthy rich preying on the financially struggling families, but it wasn't. There was no compelling story here. Yeah, the kids are abused, but why are they abused? Because they live with abusers? Boom. Easy. I feel like Aaron Borgai tried to dodge making his villain's motive resemble Jigsaw's but ended up creating the most one-dimensional pieces of shit possible, which is a shame. Anyway, let me know what you thought of the book down in the comments. Scripting this shit was so fucking hard by the way, so a little subscription, a little like, a little tiny comment wouldn't hurt. I feel like to my 500 and counting subscribers who all came from a funny Abbott Elementary compilation with you, this is going to seem so out of place. They're going to be so confused, but this is me. All right, fellas, this is the real me. I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. I didn't think I was going to end this video by quoting Notting Hill, but yes, that's what I'm doing. So that's really cool. I gotta go and eat a burger and fries. I need to I need to go cleanse my soul.